最高Because you have a greater purpose than any of us could have ever imagined. Welcome to the official podcast for HBO's The Last of Us. I'm your host, Troy Baker. First, a little setup to help contextualize these conversations. The Last of Us is a new original series from HBO based on the critically acclaimed video game of the same name. This game was made by the studio Naughty Dog and originally released in 2013. I'm joined by showrunners Craig Mazin. Hello. And Neil Druckmann. Hey, Troy. And as showrunners, Craig and Neil have remarkable insight into how each episode was made and what went into shaping the key moments that we're going to unpack. But each of us have a unique perspective on the series because of our involvement with the game. Craig, writer and director, is approaching as a fan who was so moved by his experience that he wanted to adapt it for television. Neil, co-president of Naughty Dog, was one of the creators of The Last of Us, and myself, an actor who played Joel in the game. Now, this is a weekly podcast which airs after every episode airs, so this will be a very spoiler-heavy conversation. So we definitely encourage you to watch the episode and then join us for the conversation afterwards. Before we get too into the weeds, maybe we could help kind of set up, Neil, your involvement and the games that we'll be referencing. Yeah, so my name is Neil Druckmann. I was the creative director and writer on the original Last of Us game that came out in 2013. The genre was a survival action game. It's a story that takes place in a post-apocalyptic world that has been ravaged by a cordycep outbreak. And we follow Joel Miller in the Boston quarantine zone, where Joel is a black market smuggler, and he gets tasked with transporting Ellie, who's special for some reason, across the United States. We wanted to make an experience that really explored the unconditional love a parent feels for a child. How can we construct a story that through its interaction, through its characters, through the relationship, through music, through everything we have at our disposal, make you feel the wonderful and horrible things that can come out of love? Yeah, you know, when we wrote that show Bible, show Bible is just a long outline, basically. Right there on the front page, I think we said, this is a love story. And that's not good because what we wanted to dig into is the theme that came out of the game that I mean Naughty Dog, Neil's company made The Last of Us. They made The Last of Us Part Two. They made Left Behind, which came out in between those two games. Throughout those games, and I think throughout our series, we will continue to come back to the notion that love conquers all. And that's problematic, that we think of love as this solely positive thing. A beautiful thing and it is but love especially the love that a parent has for a child is primal and it can lead to the most intense fear and the most intense fear can lead to the most intense behavior including violence and if you scratch the surface of tribalism racism xenophobia you will find love love is not always good and when we talk about this show and as we go episode by episode, we're going to meet people that love each other over and over and over. And we're going to see this dynamic play out over and over and over. What brought this about? Was this kind of the agents talking to each other? Was this a Twitter romance? Like what, what, how did this come to be? Actually, it's our uh, mutual friend for all three of us, Shannon Woodward. So while working on Last of Us 2, she's uh, one of the cast members of that game. She made an introduction for me and, and, and Craig. And, you know, at the time, I'd already had one failed uh, version of trying to adapt this into a movie where it just, to put simply, it was too big, too big for a movie script. And no matter how hard I tried, I just could not crack it. So there was still conversation about, is there no way to approach it a, a different way? And so that conversation is happening. And then I eventually watch Chernobyl and I'm blown away by it. It's one of the best TV shows I have ever seen. And then I find out, oh, it's this guy that Shannon introduced me to that I haven't had a chance to have lunch with yet. So I immediately want to meet Craig now that I've seen Chernobyl. After I played The Last of Us, I was just in awe. 
of the game. I was in awe of Neil. I didn't know him, so he just seemed like this mysterious sage on a mountain somewhere that I could not approach. But as the years go on, I become friendly with Shannon. I hear that she's working on The Last of Us Part Two. I'm obsessed. And she says, you know, you and Neil would be best friends. And I'm like, awesome. <laughs> How do I do that? And she goes, well, <laughs> you know, he's sort of shy. It's kind of hard to get through to him and he's really busy. And I'm like, okay, well, I would just love, you know, at any point to just sit down with him and, and just tell him how much I love what he's done. And at the same time, Sony had been talking to me about, hey, here are all these games we have. Which one of these do you think could be a good game to adapt? And I'm like, mm, I don't see The Last of Us on here. And they're like, eh, that one, Neil's doing that one. I'm like, eh, I get it. And then around the time that Chernobyl came out, the adaptation rights for The Last of Us reverted back to Naughty Dog and Neil, and he saw Chernobyl, and it all just kind of came together. Uh, and we meet up for lunch next to Naughty Dog, and we just chat and compliment each other. I get to gush about his work. And then, you know, he's just, I'm really curious about the process of how he was able to make this TV show at HBO. I'm a huge HBO fan, like The Wire, The Leftovers, The Six Feet Under, some of my favorite shows of all time. Uh, so I asked him just like offhandedly, you know, let's just assume we wanted to make this as a TV show at HBO. What would that look like? And he said, oh, it'd be very easy. We go across the street and we meet with them. And I tell them I want that to be my next project and we make it my next project. <laughs> so I'm going into this meeting not knowing what to expect. So I just kind of sit there and I let I, I follow Craig's lead. And he launches into a pitch for the story for for the executives that are in the room. And then I'm like, okay, do I jump in? Do I help out? I was like, what if I don't? What if I just lean back in my chair and watch someone else pitch the story that I've pitched a million times? And I'm finding that he's going through it beat by beat. And first I'm impressed just how well he knows it. I'm being moved by a story that has become so rote to me at that point because I've, I've told this pitch so many times and I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to this emotional reaction I'm having. And again, I feel the passion this guy has for the material. And then he finishes the pitch and then uh, Casey stands up and he's like, well, Craig, I told you whatever your next project is has to make you float. This is clearly it. And they turn to me and he's like, it was a pleasure meeting you. Let's make this show. And we all shake hands right then and there. And then we're off to the races making this TV show. Let's talk about the cold open. And uh, Dr. Newman, you're also an epidemiologist. I presume the prospect of a viral pandemic keeps you up at night as well. No. No? No. All right, well, that's our show. <laughs> <laughs> no, mankind has been at war with the virus from the start. Sometimes millions of people die as in an actual war, but in the end, we always win. Uh, but you, uh, just to be clear, you, you do think microorganisms pose a threat? Oh, in the most dire terms. Bacteria? No. You like saying no? Yes. <laughs> Not bacteria, not viruses, so... Fungus. <laughs> yes, that's the usual response. Fungi seem harmless enough. Many species know otherwise, because there are some fungi who seek not to kill, but to control. Who came up with the idea of doing this? It was Craig. Okay. When you pitched that to him... Yeah. Are you going... Well, I pitched it twice. Okay. <laughs> I pitched it twice. The first time I pitched it, he was like... Or we can, you know, we can do the video because there's this great video. You can see it on YouTube. It's Planet Earth. You can watch this beautiful demonstration of how cordyceps works, how it takes over an ant. It's quite horrifying. And it tells you everything you need to know. So what we had decided to do was make our own little video like that, which is interesting, but not necessarily compelling. It was a bit of an intellectual argument. Okay. You're being kind. It was kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little boring. It was a little boring. It was a little boring to watch, and it was a little bit like, oh, we're in social studies class. And I had written this thing actually like early, 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 as if I had found a transcript of an old Dick Cavett from 1969. Oh, Dick Cavett. Yeah. And I remember showing it to Neil, and he was like, oh, this is a little weird. <laughs> and then we, we go make the whole show, and we're about, I don't know, three or four weeks away from rapping. And I'm like, dude, I am not thrilled with this opening. And so I sent it to him again. And this time he was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> seeing the final version, seeing it edited, I loved it. 
as a fan, it catches you off guard and, and, and already signals to you everything you think you know about this, right. you don't know about this. Yeah. And, and I thought it achieved what we were trying to achieve with that other opening in a much more effective, dramatized way that starts giving you clues or like theories of like, maybe this is how it started. We're not saying definitively, but this is a pretty good theory. Yes. Because then you're going to these like, quote unquote, mundane moments with the Miller family. And this elevated all those scenes because now because of that opening, there's a tension that's just like hanging in the air. So when they're having breakfast, it's tense. When they're driving to school, it's tense. When she's in that watch shop, everything became more tense and more captivating because of this opening. You contextualized it. Yeah. Yeah. And there was also a chance to address the elephant in the global room, which is we all just went through a viral pandemic. Mm. And I thought it was important to say to people, we are not a show that's asking you to share some of your own personal horror about the viral pandemic with us. We're not drafting off of it. We're here to tell you there's actually something much worse. That viral pandemics uh, will happen again. They have happened before. There will be millions of people who will die again. This is part of the natural cycle of the planet. But what has not happened yet is a fungal pandemic. And if it does, it is, we're, we're not making that up. It's going to be terrible and possibly unrecoverable because fungi are far more complicated and far more integrated into the life and death cycle of the earth than viruses are. So <clears throat> we wanted to sort of acknowledge that everybody went through this and then dig in a little underneath it and say, sorry to tell you, but uh, there's something worse behind it. Viruses can make us ill, but fungi can alter our very minds. There's a fungus that infects insects, gets inside an ant, for example, travels through its circulatory system to the ant's brain and then floods it with hallucinogens, thus bending the ant's mind to its will. Because you're making this for two audiences, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's two people that are sitting down and, and watching this. People, people who, who have played play the game, people, people who, who haven't. Have right. So this feels like... It's taking the people that have no idea what the story is about and, and helping to contextualize what the story is really about. But then also saying to the people who have played the game. Get ready. Yeah. Be on your toes. Yeah. And I think that it is value added for people who have played the game because I have played the game. And I was always sort of on alert for that. You know, if there's something comes in that's wildly different and new, would it feel to me as somebody who played the game like I'm getting to see awesome new stuff mm. as opposed to just different or pointlessly different. One of the things that the opening does is place everything also within the context of a longer time span. It was important to me that this opening take place many, many decades before Cordyceps comes around because I like the idea that these things that come and get us don't just show up when we need them to because we're starting to air a television show. Somebody knows 30, 40, 50 years it's ago. It's a slow burn. Today happens to be the day it finally happens, but it was waiting out there. And we were told, and that's a very, you know, kind of Chernobyl thing that I'm obsessed with is the idea that we know things and we all agree that they're going to happen and then we pretend they're not. For what this show is really about, you really took your time to show a single infected you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like the, the first time that you do see someone infected, it's it's the wonderful, you know, neighbor next door. Yes. Nana. Which was horrifying. Good. And the, <laughs> the, the thing to me that was so horrifying is, and this is, to me, it's not a cliche. It's, it's a very useful tool. When animals pick up on stuff before we do. Yes. That moment with dog. <laughs> it's just <laughs> terrifying. I remember experiencing the prologue of the game and when that neighbor shows up and Joel has to shoot him, it's terrifying. And we thought, well, we have an opportunity to, to meet that person first. If you know somebody and you see them smiling and talking to you and then you see what they look like, it's that much more scary. And then the question is, well, what's scarier than a middle-aged next door neighbor guy? <laughs> How about an incredibly elderly person who can't even move? Right. Because once the fungus gets inside, we like the idea that it could just simply root around whatever had gone wrong in your brain and led to catatonia or Parkinson's or any of these kind of neuromuscular disorders 
and essentially started to animate her again. That seemed the scariest of all. There's a contradiction of like the infected being beautiful and incredibly scary at the same time. And here's this the weird contradiction of like, it's fixing her. Yeah. Right? It's fixing what's broken inside of her. Right. But it's taken her mind with it. Yes. That this person who essentially was the kind of, you forget about them, right? They're in, she tries to feed her jello. Why am I talking to her? She's deaf. She's kind of comic. We made a point of making this sort of joke about how she couldn't even eat biscuits. All right. By the way, a lot of little details are going to come back around. We don't want to give spoilers, but I will say this. Careful viewers of this episode will be rewarded repeatedly because little bits of breadcrumbs have been planted that are going to pay off later in interesting ways. Both of you have a separate attachment to these characters. And for you, Neil, this is a story that you helped create. You helped shape these characters. How do the two of you create a new story that remains true to the one that brought you to where you're at now? So Craig and I started working while we, uh, we are at Naughty Dog finishing Last of Us Part Two. So Craig would come over for lunches and we would start breaking the season. And I think one of the first things we did is just talk about what stays? What are the things that like we mm. should absolutely keep? And like the outbreak being from Sarah's POV, that felt like an important thing to keep. And I think we, we just started putting a bunch of pins and things. And then you started looking at, well, where are the gaps? Where are the things that we felt like the game is doing something that would not work on the show? Um, and usually it was surrounded with a lot of action. Because for the game, you need that kind of gameplay and you, you have to have enough gameplay to understand how it works and works on an instinctual level to create certain emotions that you just cannot create in this other medium. But there's a lot of other pros that you could do. You could expand on things like when we're saying you're going to be with Sarah for a while, right. you could really stretch that out and get to see more of the dynamics of this family in a way we could not do in the game. But you're coming in it as a fan, yes, right? So how do you take the story and translate that story into a medium that it was not originally intended for. I really enjoy playing stealth-based action games. Always have. And The Last of Us provided some really cool stealth-based stuff. And then obviously there's sequences where it's just full-on crazy. And then completely separate from that was the experience I had of watching what I, I hesitate to use the word cutscene because it diminishes, I think, what you guys did, which was to create a passively experienced work of art with narrative and character relationship that I could watch like a show or like a movie. It's more to note a cutscene is a, a non interactive moment in the game where you get to watch, like a TV show, a sequence that's played in front of you cinematically. Usually it's one to five minutes long. Yes. So when I sat down with Neil, part of that process of like, okay, what do we keep was really, to me, it was all about figuring out what I experienced passively that I loved. And the very first thing I remember Neil and I talking about that was, okay, let's step aside from the, the way the game works and let's just talk about what we would do. And I remember we were talking about how to quickly and effectively dramatize how different Joel was after 20 years. We meet him. We see this traumatic event occur. We jump ahead in 20 years. How do we show in this, the most visceral way, uh, unburdened by teaching people how to walk, move, jump, and crawl, right. how do we show how different he is? And that's when we came up with this notion that after experiencing his daughter dying in his arms and how broken that made him 20 years later he's the one who has no problem picking up another dead body of a child and dumping it into the fire because he's closed off completely the mirroring of that for me when i'm watching the episode because you go from a father holding the child to the 20 years later you start on this boy Yep. walking mindlessly almost, seeking asylum. What if I told you that after we gave you some medicine, we're gonna find you your favorite food to eat? Would you like that? And then we'll get you some new clothes and toys, as many as you wanna play with. It's 
just a little needle. It's okay. You're safe. I thought we did a really good job there. Mm -hmm. Because there's all the stuff we want to teach people, just like, you know, in the video game, you teach them, but you have to teach them in a different way because they need to move around. Here, we're not moving around, we're watching. And we wanted to show that Fedra was not an easy villain, but also certainly not the good guys. We wanted to establish the scanner because that scanner comes back later. Just a little simple practical thing like that mm -hmm. matters a lot when you're watching to show what it means when the light turns red and what the cost is when the light turns red. Right. Yeah, that, this is actually a great example of a change made from the game because the equivalent of the scene in the game is right after the 20 years later, you you are walking around as Joel and you see people lined up, right. getting scanned, and one of them tests positive and gets shot, right. which lets you... It tells you a lot about how Fedra operates and what the scanner is, which also, again, s serving similar functions, but in a more immersive way that it feels it feels like something you could miss. As well as also yeah. because Joel just walk, you can't just walk past her. It is something that is happening as you're moving. It is a pedestrian, borderline banal thing. Like yes. people get lined up, people get pulled out, people get test positive, people get shot. Which is this a happens. tonal thing. Yes. Because the other thing is the when you are playing a game. I, I can't necessarily explain why, but somebody getting shot in the street in the QZ and then other people going move along and people move along feels acceptable. When you are shooting live action with people, people, if someone gets shot in the street, people are going to scream hmm. and there's going to be blood and brains and horror and it's upsetting and children are going to cry and people are going to run. It, it's just a different thing. So we have to start to think also about violence because Violence in video games is far more palatable, I think. Yeah. One thing, like, if we want to talk about things we didn't get right. Yes. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> this episode one used to be episode one and episode two. That's right. 100%. So, like, it that. used to just end on the 20 years later and seeing the kid and seeing Joel throw the kid in the fire. And that was it. That was yep. episode one. Why the change? Well... HBO, I think correctly, and this yeah. is where you want good partners at the network, right? Like I always feel like the best network executives are there to honestly represent the audience. That's what they could do best. They're not supposed to write things for us. They're supposed to tell us how they feel and we are supposed to have faith in their proxy ability. And in this case, our proxies there, Casey Bloys and Franny Orsi, were saying it's not necessarily going to make me want to come back, right? Like the whole season, the whole story of The Last of Us is about Joel and Ellie. Well, if we only get like a little glimpse of her at the end of episode one, and we don't bring them together and we don't understand their journey. And it just ends with a kid dying and then another kid dying and then credits. People may just not want to come back. And it was important for them because they love the show. Right. And they were like, we need, we, it will hurt all of us in our hearts if they don't want to come back. And in hindsight, the feedback makes complete sense. Yeah, they were right. Um, right. Cause like we, we had a, like a version where we, we ended on Ellie and looking out the window and you see that she's changed. You're like, oh, there's a mystery here. But like, we haven't established why you should care about this kid. We care about this kid right. because we know where this journey is going and how important this kid is. And it's like, I remember when I worked on the game, this was always like a test for people. I would be like, what's the inciting incident? Mm -hmm. And they'd be like, oh, when Sarah dies, obviously. I'm like, nope. <laughs> it's when Joel runs into Ellie. That's the thing that changes his life. Right. And, and I'm like, oh, we didn't get to that moment. We have to get to that moment. That's the start of this journey. Yeah. So that's why, again, in hindsight, that feedback makes complete sense. And the episode is so much better for it. Yep. I mean, the plot of our show obviously is going to relate very closely to the plot of the game. And if you want to boil the plot of the game down to its simplest, it's man takes girl from A to B. I, I could even, the log line is, I need a battery. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, like, that's the thing. Is... So the question is like, we really did, in the game, because you're spending so much time in the beginning learning how to play, the game could not put plot on you. Hmm. If they put a bunch of plot on you, it would have felt like, oh my God, I, but I'm still learning how to duck. I'm still learning how to listen and throw a bottle. We didn't have that constraint. 
And we felt it was important to create an urgency for our protagonist that was not at all connected to Ellie. That meeting Ellie was something that interrupted this urgency. Right. And that that urgency, which in this case was, it was sort of a simple invention, but I think it works pretty well. He talks to Tommy via this, we created this kind of like, uh, you network know, of... Yes, network of ham radio operators, which made sense to us. It felt realistic. And Tommy and he would exchange messages and he hasn't heard back from Tommy in three weeks and he's panicked and he needs to go save his brother. Because, and that in and of itself is an interesting thematic choice for Joel that gets paid off. But in his desire to get a truck battery, to put in a truck, to be able to drive, to get out to Wyoming, he gets thrown into the path of this essentially this crime that occurs between Robert and Tess and Joel. What do you want? I want you to forget this ever happened. Done. Don't do that. What? It's just a truck battery. I paid you for it, you sold it to someone else, and you spend my money. I mean, you think I've never done shit like that? My guys fucked you up. Yeah, so discipline them. They cut off her finger or whatever the fuck you want. I don't care, they're your fucking guys. From the onset, you have different characters. Robert is different. Yep. Tess is different. Tess is different. Yep. Of course, he's played by Anna Torv. There's a hardness to her yeah. that really, really speaks to this version. Yeah. There was one moment that we have in the game where you can see that Tess is the one who's leading Joel and Joel is the muscle. Mm -hmm. There's some stuff that makes me angry that, that, <laughs> that Pedro does because it's so good. Even his reaction when Tess says he got the battery. Nothing's lost. And this shit like this is gonna happen. Now we just shake it off and we go get our cards back or the battery. I need the battery, Tess. Truck's no good without one. And if I don't get to Tommy soon, he's gonna die out there. His reaction sells the desperation of a simple thing. I need you to take a breath. Who'd he sell it to? Don't know. Well, where is he? Don't know. Yet. But we're gonna find out quietly. Understand? No, I promised Robert that you wouldn't hurt him. But I would very much like for you to hurt him. So let's go hunt that motherfucker down and get our battery and our truck. And then we'll go find Tommy. All right? She's kind of treating him like a child. I yes. need you to take a breath. And that yep. makes him feel so dangerous. Yep. And I, I, I love that. I love that dynamic between them. Like, she's one of the few that can control him. She's I'm like so the, glad you the said Joel that. Whisperer. It's, that, that, was, <laughs> that, was, that scene was Anna's first day. Oh, Jesus. And, and I was directing. And she was very kind of, like, anxious and hyper. And she kept telling me, this is, this is just first day Anna. It's first day Anna. And, and I thought, well, first day Anna is, is pretty damn good. Because she nailed exactly what Neil's talking about. The notion of Joel as a little bit of a Frankenstein monster, uh, it is more dangerous to know that there is something volatile in him, that if she doesn't calm him down, he will go out there and hurt people. Now, this is not the same man we saw right. at the beginning of the episode. Something right. profound has changed. But what is interesting about the relationship as it progresses, and we will see more next week when hopefully people return to watch the next episode <laughs> that Neil directed, that relationship is more complicated than we think. But the way she gently took control of that situation tells us everything we need to know. She is smart. She is insightful. She cares about him, clearly. There's a love there, which is quite beautiful. And she is the only person that ultimately, I, I guess she's been sort of using him uh, when she wants to let the genie out of the bottle, she lets she says, I would very much like for you to hurt him. Well, that's how you know that when that, the time is right, she's going to release him. And that was a command. Yes. So here's what I want you to do. Yes. We're working our way kind of towards the end, and there's there's another divergence in speaking to before. We just kind of stumble upon Ellie. Yep. We really get the opportunity to establish Ellie well beforehand. We see this unique relationship that Marlene has and, and the involvement there. So can I go? No. I won't tell anyone about any of this, I swear. Where are you gonna go? Back to Federal Military School? 
You that anxious to be a soldier? You think I chose that place? They put me there when I was a baby. It's for orphans. They didn't put you there. I did. Ellie. I'd love to talk a little bit more about where that came from and, and sure. why, why not just stumble upon Ellie like we did in the game. Part of the reason we would have had to wait that much longer to see Ellie. Yes, and also there was something in the game that felt natural about discovering her in this process as Joel because you are Joel in the game. But we are not Joel watching the show. Yes. And so it felt almost diminishing if we just happen to just land on this kid. We wanted a chance to meet her alone. And we also thought we had an opportunity to explain something interesting that Neil couldn't have done in the first game because he hadn't done Left Behind yet. Mm, talking so about Riley. You, yes. Yeah, so here's the sudden, so what happened to Ellie and who's Riley? And why was Marlene the person that found them? And also, how does Marlene even know her name? And what does this mean that Marlene put her there? There's this rich history that we are hinting at that will become perfectly plain and clear as the season goes on. And the relationship between Ellie and Marlene in the game was sort of like, look, just take this kid. I need you to take this kid. It's important. Here you get the sense that Marlene has this profound connection to Ellie. Mm -hmm which will be something that we're going to pay off and pull on quite a bit later on. One of the biggest changes between the game and the show is the game is hardcore, that everything you're experiencing, everything you're seeing is either completely from Joel's perspective, Ellie's perspective, or for a tiny bit, Sarah's perspective. Right. That's it. In the game, Tess tells you that she got jumped by Robert's men. Here you get to see it. It's hinted at the, in the game that there's a romantic relationship between Joel and Tess. And here we see her crawl into bed with him. Like, right. again, we don't explicitly say it, but it's like, eh, it's pretty much there. Right. You know that at some point, uh, Marlene found Ellie and she found out his particular circumstances. Here you get to see more of that, of like, okay, how was she held? How did they decide to eventually leave with her? Like, you're coming into the game post all those things. Here we get to dramatize and see them. So in a way, this is doing, like it's making the game richer because these events that are referred to offhandedly, mm -hmm. you get to experience what they were like. The way the fireflies show up in the series is very different than the game. So let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about the fireflies for a minute. Well, I would drive Neil crazy with my questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would like, okay, how, does, how do you join the fireflies? How do they know who to trust? How many are there? Where do they live? Is there one building? Is there multiple buildings? How are, what they, are they painting doing graffiti today? inside of here if they exist outside? All of these questions, I'm constantly asking these questions. Often we, I can refer to facts. Like, for example, we had some information of how Riley was recruited. So we could talk about that. I'm like, and then I would tell him, here are things we've talked about while making the game that never made it into the game. So that's, that, this was our thinking. This was our internal logic. And here are actual facts of what we saw in the game. So whenever we could, we would lean into the facts. And then whenever there was a chance to elaborate or make something more, even more grounded, we would jump at that opportunity. So we have to talk about Bella Ramsey, who, of course, plays Ellie. You know, we always said, like, Neil and I said, we know the character of Ellie as it was inspired by the game. We have put that into the page. We are going to put that into our actors as we direct. They will perform. They don't need to play the game and see it. They probably shouldn't. And yet they just had Elliness, yeah. that combination of wisdom and sass and fear. You guys go out there a lot? I guess. When was the last time? Maybe a year, what's it matter? But you know where to go. So we're gonna be okay. Yeah. So what's the deal with you anyway? You some kind of big wig's daughter or something? Something like that. But I love that scene because when he wakes up, she's afraid. She doesn't want to show him she's afraid, but she asks questions that indicate that she's afraid. 
which catches him, and this is where Pedro is mm-hmm. amazing, leaning forward to put her at ease because no matter how closed off he insists he is, he's not. When he's, she's, he's, says, he's a dad and he will always he be a dad. He will always be a dad. It just kind of comes out, right? There's this, it's, he can't help himself, but he's certainly not going to be demonstrative about it. He's certainly not going to go over right. there and say, listen, it's going to be, he's it's not going to be comfort, okay. He's like, comfort her. This is as good as I can get it. And if he had, she would have been like, oh, hey, right. who the fuck are you? But of course, then after he does that, she turns around and gives him shit <laughs> because she's Ellie yeah. and, and she's paying him back for him being a jerk when he walked in the room in the first place. There's another moment specifically between Joel and Ellie right towards the end. They come out of the tunnel. You're going to be shitting me. Okay, let's talk this out. Turn around. Yeah, Get hold on. Get on your fucking knees. Get on your fucking knees. Yeah, hold on. What did I fucking tell you, man? I said stay the fuck home. Get on your knees. Ellie pulls at the knife. She stabs him. The use of flashback is, is a really... It's dangerous. A, it's a dangerous <laughs> trap. Yes, it right? is. Most people, I think, use a flashback as a cheap way of exposition. Right. That's not what this was. No. The flashback was... A flashback. You you need to see what's happening inside of his head right, right like a, now. Like a, like a traumatic flashback, like a proper one. And you see that this man has PTSD. Yes. And he doesn't get angry. There's no even sense of survival. It is pure rage. Well, it is it is pure rage when it manifests. But right before it's pure rage, if you look at Pedro's face, and he's so wonderful in this moment, it's this crushing sadness Mm -hmm. before the anger is mourning and Mm -hmm. grief you can see his heart breaking all over again and in this he's very close in the frame and i remember on that day we had gone through a bunch of those things and we were still you know kind of finding joel because it was early you know in the process and making this first episode and one of the things that I kept saying to him was, was because you're so naturally tough and gruff and masculine and Joel, the more you can show me a scared, sad, frightened kid inside of you, the more I will connect with you and feel everything else. And he, that was the moment where he came to me and goes, I got it. I got it. I got it. That's it. There's Joel right there. It's that moment before he goes crazy. And then when he goes crazy, I understand why. It's not to punish this guy. Yes. It's because his heart is just blown open. Then there's also the moment after. And then there's the moment after. To me, the moment is, I did it again. Yep. That's almost look of apologetic and realizing I just did this in front of a girl and he looks and then there's the look from Allie. Yeah. That's my favorite. That's my favorite. Any 14-year-old girl yep. would be mortified by what she saw, and she's leaning in. Yep. Look earlier in the episode when Joel hits the old lady in the head with the wrench. Sarah is horrified and cries, even though that woman mm-hmm. was trying to kill her, basically. And she says, you killed her. She can't believe what she just saw. She just saw her father murder someone. Ellie sees something that isn't one swing and he, and that guy wasn't even threatening Joel's life. No. And he beats him to death over, it like punches him over and over and over and Ellie is activated. And this is going to echo forward. This is something that Neil and I talked about a lot, which was understanding where Ellie goes and understanding what the connection is between Joel and Ellie that there's a thread between them that is more than just, I used to have a kid and you're also a kid. There's something else. That there's the connection already between Joel and Ellie that is different from his connection with his own daughter and perhaps potentially stronger and certainly potentially more dangerous. Right. There's a a looking up to what this man is capable of. Yeah. That Ellie wants for herself. I want to pick on one one last thing. And Neil, I know how much music means to you with this story specifically. So we end the yeah. episode on the Depeche Mode. Yeah, never let me down again. Yeah, never let me down again. There's a couple of different 
things throughout this this series that people will see where music plays a part and there's different versions of it. Obviously, we established there's a code of music, which is really cool that again, I love that Ellie picks up on the fact that this mm-hmm. is this is what this means and she kind of tricks Joel into thinking that. I love the juxtaposition of a song that's 80s and happy is signaling something we're moving this thing horrible. Where did that song come from? There is a grand tradition of 80s music in The Last of Us and The Last of Us Part Two, Mm -hmm. And 80s means trouble. I love that line because one of the things that Neil has done so beautifully in the work at Naughty Dog that he does is hurt you for the things you love and taking things that are bright and beautiful and cheery and optimistic and getting this dark undertone. And a lot of 80s music is chipper and fun, but Never Let Me Down Again, what I was looking for was an 80s song that felt at least initially like, oh, it's an up-tempo 80s song, (laughs) but lyrically had a darkness to it. And what it's about is I'm taking a ride with my best friend. Now, what he was singing about was drugs. Right. It was a song about addiction. Well, Ellie's about to take a ride with her best friend. And Joel is a dangerous man. And Joel is about to take a ride with his best friend. He doesn't know if she's his best friend yet. And she's a dangerous little girl. And the whole point is, you're never going to let me down. Now, they are going to let each other down. And then they're not. And then they are. And then they're not. And that, that I thought was a really interesting way in. We are going to hear that song again. I won't tell you when or how, but it will be in a very different way and in a very different context. We are just at the start of their journey together. The music comes up and this episode ends with the huge reveal that Ellie has a bite mark. She tests positive on the Fedra scanner and she may not be showing signs of being infected now, but Joel and Tess know that it's just a matter of time. So wherever we're going, we're definitely heading into trouble, which I can't wait to talk about in next week's episode. Craig, Thanks a million, man, for being here. Thanks, Troy. And of course, the same to you, Neil. Goodbye. We will talk to you both next week. This has been the official podcast for HBO's The Last of Us. I'm Troy Baker, joined as always by showrunners Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann. You can stream new episodes of the HBO original series, The Last of Us, Sundays on HBO Max. And then this podcast episode will air after that episode airs. And you can find that wherever you listen to podcasts. Please like and follow HBO's The Last of Us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And remember, when you're lost in the darkness, look for the light. This is the official companion podcast for HBO's The Last of Us, hosted by Troy Baker. Our producers are Elliot Adler, Bria Mariette, and Noah Camuso. Darby Maloney is our editor. The show is mixed by Hannes Brown. Our executive producers are Gabrielle Lewis and Barry Finkel. Production music is courtesy of HBO, and you can watch episodes of The Last of Us on HBO Max.